This is a Fox News alert. Chaos and violence erupting in the city of St. Louis. A former officer's acquittal sparking violence. <laughs> Ten officers injured. Nine are St. Louis cops. One a highway patrolman. After you uh, have these emotional uh, fits, you have to look at the facts. Move back! Move back! Police lives matter too, period. A Fox News alert. British police arrest an 18-year-old in connection with the terror attack on a packed London train. Radical Islamic terrorism. It will be eradicated, believe me. North Korea's missile launch yesterday went further than any previous missile launch fired by Kim Jong-un's regime. We've been kicking the can down the road and we're out of road. There is a military option. This is 11-year-old boy. All he wanted to do was mow the White House lawn. This is Frank. He's going to be very famous. Going to be a Navy SEAL someday. <laughs> Maybe he'll be president. Welcome to Fox and Friends, and we begin with a Fox News alert. Breaking in arrest in connection with the London subway terror attack. This as ISIS claims responsibility for the rush hour explosion that injured more than a dozen people. Ellison Barber live for us in Washington, D.C., with more on the response coming from the White House at this hour. Ellison, good morning. Good morning. British police say the investigation is ongoing, but the arrest of an 18-year-old is, quote, significant. Police took the man into custody. They say he is tied in some way to Friday's early morning bombing that injured almost 30 people, some of them children heading to school. According to the Associated Press, the 18-year-old man is being held for questioning under the Terrorism Act and has not been charged or publicly identified. He was arrested in Dover. That's a coastal town in England. It's a major port for ferries heading to France. Police will reportedly transfer the man to a London police station and question him there. ISIS claimed responsibility for Friday's attack, and Prime Minister Theresa May raised the threat level from severe to critical. It's the highest threat level and means an attack could be imminent. President Trump sent out a series of tweets after the attack, and in one tweet, he suggested the perpetrators were known to Scotland Yard. Prime Minister May pushed back on that in an interview yesterday, saying it was, quote, not helpful to speculate on an ongoing investigation. In another said, quote, loser terrorist must be dealt with in a much tougher manner, adding the Internet is their main recruitment tool, which we must cut off. May and Trump spoke on the phone yesterday. According to the White House, they spoke about the attack and the threat from North Korea. Here's President Trump yesterday. I spoke with a wonderful woman, British Prime Minister Theresa May, this morning and relayed America's deepest sympathy as well as our absolute commitment to eradicating the terrorists from our planet. Radical Islamic terrorism. It will be eradicated, believe me. Both leaders are set to address the United Nations General Assembly next week. Abby, Pete, Todd. All right, Elson Barber, thanks so much. Thank you, Elson. Yeah, the president's uh, response very strong. If you think, think about the depth and scope of the threat that the U.K. faces. Their top intelligence official says that 35,000 fanatical Islamists inside that country, 3,000 on the radar for a potential attack, 500 monitored 24-7. You, They have been silently invaded by a very coherent, very radical ideology that seeks their own destruction from within. So as much as we, we look at these things and, and we want to wish them away, this is the fifth terror attack in that country in this year alone. And so when President Trump says it's time to get serious, he means it. We've been, we've been invaded. Either we fight back with the tools necessary or we allow ourselves to be terrorized, which is what's happening right now. You're right. I mean, you think about what ISIS has been threatening. You know their magazine, Inspire? Mm -hmm. This is what they have been threatening for a while now, the, the, the future wave of attack attacks is going to be these train and subway attacks during rush hour. When you think about trains, when you think about here in New York City, I take the subway every single day. We don't have really much security there. Sometimes they're police officers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're, they're dressed in regular clothes. But you compare that to the airports and, and, and other things that are protected. I mean, we don't want to be living in this world where every but the, this is the threat we're now facing. And the U.K., as you said, Pete, is dealing with it much more than we are. They have 3,000 suspected terrorists. We had Nigel Farage on the show who said that is the challenge that Theresa May faces. Here's what he said. Whether Trump is right in that the people...
people behind this were known to the authorities already, we don't yet know. But, I'll tell you something, in most cases, the pattern is very clear. These are young males who've dropped out of education, who've drifted into drugs and extreme forms of Islam, and in nearly every single case, they are known to the authorities. The real question that Theresa May's got to confront is, what do we do with the 3,000 people living in Britain who are suspected terrorists? 500 of them have a permanent trail, the rest don't. And that is something the British government is going to very seriously have to get to grips with. When are we going to wake up to the fact that these people are not citizens? These people are soldiers of an enemy inside our countries. Why are we monitoring them? Why are we not stripping their rights and throwing them in jail, saying you are an enemy combatant, we are at war with you, we are done. We are revoking your citizenship, go back where you came from, go fight with ISIS over there if you want to. And I don't understand how many attacks will it take for that mindset to percolate into whether it's Theresa May. I know President Trump thinks that way, but political correctness holds him back. That's why he says things about travel bans. Why are we letting people in who seek our own destruction? At some point, the West is going to have to wake up to this internal invasion. Why, when President Trump doesn't beat around the bush, he's attacked, but when everybody else beats around the bush, and we have our, you said a great point earlier, oh, thoughts and prayers, we hope our thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers do not prevent the death and destruction that we are seeing, especially in England, but which they try to do here in America, in which, let's remember, 9-11. Let's not forget about that. Why are thoughts and prayers? Oh, it's nice. No, the, you got yeah, to do Well, and this could have been much worse because this happened above ground. It could have happened below ground. But you think yeah. about the bomb that was made. It was in this like construction-looking bucket. It was covered in what looked like a grocery bag. If you were to walk on a train or something, you probably wouldn't look twice. You'd sure. Think, well, likely just made in someone's kitchen in their home. These homemade bombs. That's what so frightening about this. They're really, really hard to detect. We had experts on the show yesterday said that's tough to come by to figure out how to find those bombs. What we do need to do is more have more vigilance in finding these people, to your point. You're right. And you mentioned Inspire magazine. La their last edition literally said, go make bombs and put them in yeah. trains. I mean, there's a direct connection to these things. You talk about thoughts and prayers. You know, we talk about the effective range of, of weapon systems in the yeah. military. You know what the effective range is? Zero meters. Zero, uh, shock. You know, zero. I mean, good. I, listen, I believe in prayer, the power of Prayer is very important. Yeah, we're not attacking prayer. Don't get us well, no, wrong. No, no, I, I know you're not. But, I mean, the reality is, is like, enough of that nonsense. Yeah. Let's start doing something yeah. real with it from our leaders. Let's be vigilant. Let's be smarter. As yeah. the president tweeted yesterday, let's get nasty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's get nasty. I kind of like that. All right. Well, now to another Fox News alert. We've got a lot going on this morning. Protesters raging out of control after a former police officer was acquitted in the death of a black man. Police in full riot gear pepper spraying violent crowds as demonstrators throw bottles and bricks at them in St. Louis. Ten police officers hurt in the chaos. Griff Jenkins live for us outside the mayor's house in St. Louis with the very latest. Griff, good morning. Hey, Todd, Abby, and Pete. Yeah, just take a quick look here outside the mayor's office. You see windows smashed, paint up on the wall, and that was where the riots and the protesting and I take a look at the video from last night, a scene far too familiar for the residents of St. Louis just three years ago in Ferguson. Now in downtown St. Louis, cops being attacked by protesters, uh, stomping on police cruisers, confronting the uh, police as they marched. It began peacefully shortly after 9 a.m. when Judge Timothy Wilson ruled to acquit uh, police officer Jason Stockley in the 2011 murder of Anthony Lamar uh, Smith. But as you saw, those images Last night, people had to be treated in the crowd. In total, 10 officers were injured. Nine were St. Louis cops. Uh, one was a highway patrolman. 32 arrests. Here is the acting chief poli uh, police chief, Lawrence O'Toole. Here's what he had to say about last night. Officers did deploy pepper balls as a less than lethal option after agitators continued to assault officers with objects and destroy property. We will continue to protect the citizens of St. Louis. Now, St. Louis uh, PD were tweeting a picture of a gun recovered last night, a handgun. And that's troubling because if you remember from three years ago, there were some people shot. Actually, a police officer shot at. I remember that night very well. Continued protests, which begin at 1030 today, will become uh, will not become violent. They will remain peaceful and not see more of what we saw last night. There is a U2 concert this evening, and so uh, there is some suggestion on social media that they may try and shut that down. Very interesting as all this plays out.
guys? Mm, let's hope not. Griff Jenkins, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Griff. Not sure how shutting down a U2 concert really advances your no. agenda. Who wants to stop a U2 concert? I know. I'm not sure how, Nihilists how much of this in advances an agenda. I mean, you had a great point earlier. You're saying, we're calling these protests, but anytime you throw a rock, you know, you start attacking people, that's uh, not really a protest. That's a riot. Yeah, you injure 10 police officers. You know what it takes to injure a police officer with riot she masks? It means you are, you didn't come there just to respond. You came there to do harm to the law enforcement officials. And that's why you see 32 arrests. You should see even more. That's why Antifa cowardly covers their faces because they don't want to get arrested because they're mama's boys in their basements right. who think they're stopping fascism, but they're actually just a bunch of snowflakes. But at the end of the day, those beliefs have consequences. And you see it in these actions in the street. And it doesn't advance race relations. If that's your goal, then have a conversation about criminal justice. And also, by the way, look at the facts of the case. I was just going to say that. Different. I was just going to say that because emotions run very high. And just to point out, there are a lot of good people on the ground there that are just passionate about, you know, equal rights for everybody and where it didn't get violent. But for the ones that are violent, that are, you know, hurt, there are two cops in the hospital today because yeah, of this. You yeah. know, the one has a broken jaw, I think. Facts do matter. And so when you're looking at this specific case, I mean, the judge, as you talk about all the time, Todd, right. there's a difference between letting your motions get in the way of the facts and what actually happened. And it, it seems pretty evident in the video when you watch that. Yeah. And it's a Democratic mayor, by the way, who's empathetic to these protesters, and they're still coming Attacking after her. Yeah. Yeah. Get get. All right. A lot of other headlines we're following this morning, starting with the Fox News alert. And North Korea now claiming to have conducted yet another ballistic missile test. The rogue nation releasing new photos of the launch seen here. The rocket, the same model as the one launched uh, over Japan on Friday. UN Ambassador Nikki Haley issuing a warning to North Korea as tensions continue to boil. And at that point, you know, there's not a whole lot the Security Council is going to be able to do from here when you've cut 90 percent of the trade and 30 percent of the oil. So having said that, I have no problem kicking it to General Mattis because I think he has plenty of options. The missile on Friday traveled over 2,300 miles before landing in the Pacific Ocean. We're going to keep a close eye on that story. Also, this California is now one step closer to becoming a sanctuary state. The state Senate voting overnight to pass that measure. It would expand protections for people living in the country illegally when they come into contact with law enforcement. Well, the bill now heads to the governor's desk, Jerry Brown, to sign. He is announced to support earlier for that measure this week. And a miraculous run for the Cleveland Indians. It comes to an end. And the Kansas City Royals have ended the Indians' historic win streak at 22 in a row. The Kansas City Royals beating the Indians 4-3, ending the team's American League record-setting win streak at 22 games. The Tribe was just four games shy of the official Major League record of 26. Cool. And we're yeah. making our predictions for the World Series. I predict Dodgers and those very Indians, which... I as Pete said, means it's going to be <laughs> Red Sox, Diamondbacks. Anyone else. Right. Yeah. What it takes to win 22 games it's in amazing, Major League right? Baseball, though, yeah. it's that alone incredible. Is a All right, a Fox News alert. You just heard about the arrest in the London subway bombing overnight. Well, our next guest says there's one thing we can do right now to prevent another attack like this. You know when he talks, you got to listen. Aaron Cohen on deck. Plus, Chelsea Manning won't be a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School but she will still speak to the students. Does that sound like a good idea to you? We'll discuss it. All right, 16 minutes after the hour on a very busy Saturday morning and a Fox News alert for you. This morning, British police making an arrest in connection with the terror attack on a packed London train that left more than two dozen hurt. This, as ISIS has now claimed responsibility for the explosion. So how do we prevent these kinds of attacks let's in ask, the United States? Let's ask for a member of Israel's Special Operations, Aaron Cohen. Aaron, always good to have you on with your expertise, especially on a day like this where yet another attack has happened. This is the new normal. How do we move forward? Well, guys, um, here's the key. Qu counter terror quality or great security lives in the space before the attack. And what I mean by that is, is we need to be thinking about, the Brits need to be thinking about all of that space or time before the attack occurs, because it's about preparation. And in this case, specifically in London, I can tell you that had bags been checked, and I don't want to point my finger at the Brits. I've worked with the Brits. I enjoy the Brits. I think they're, they've, I think they're one of the countries that are leading on counterterror. But in their particular subway train stations or tube stations, 
I don't believe specific bags are being checked. You can prevent these types of attacks. You have to check the bag. Somebody had to physically come in with that IED or improvised explosives dev uh, explosive device mm -hmm. and physically take that out of that bag and then put that or leave it or somewhere on that train in order for it to go off. So it's a very simple fix. The the problem is, is that there's a lot of motion involved with security. People say, oh, we can't have that type of security. It impedes our day-to-day -day, uh, day -day, you know, well-being, and we're living in a police state. Nonsense. Yeah. We're capable of doing it. We check bags. It only takes a few seconds in Israel. And security really is its almost a creative <coughs> art form. But all of that quality security lives in that vacuum Prior, or excuse me, before the attack. Aaron, you're talking about that's what we need to be thinking. You're talking about hardening targets, which is which is definitely a way to react to things like this as well. But we know of 35,000 radical Islamists in that country, 3,000 of which they think could be bent on terror, 500 of which they're monitoring constantly. At what point do you look at these people and say, "You're not a citizen of the UK. You're a, you're an enemy combatant. You are at war with us. You seek to kill our people. You do not believe in our way of life." Should their whole political system start to review how they view these people? As as opposed to, you know, trying to co commit, fight a war through police action, which is how it feels like right now. Yeah, their entire political system needs to completely be turned upside down. And the reason why is because uh, feel-good and correctness is essentially corrupted and, and eroded the, the actual fibers of the citizenry. And what I mean by that is, in Israel, we would never tolerate... Uh, uh, people within our borders in Israel, and we have, we have uh, Arabs who live inside Israel, they serve in our military, um, but they are fundamentally aligned with the Israeli state and with the, and with the, uh, with the laws and with the, um, the, the mindset and the, and the values that we hold in Israel. And, we, and we, you know, we, we need those people in our system, and we enjoy having them in Israel. And, but in the U.K., as well as here in the United States, um, to, to, to be politically correct and to not completely churn up the hatred that's embedded within your own country is not only nonsensical, but it's 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 ludicrous. Yeah. And so if it was up to me, if I was advising President Trump right now, I would be telling the president uh, it, it should be raining terrorist warrants in this country uh, against any 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 individuals who are in cahoots or in touch or support or related to a potential terrorist. I'd be making it rain warrants. And that's what mm -hmm. needs to be happening in the UK. Doors warrants cause doors to to get kicked in, which leads to intel, which prevents attacks. That's what yep. I'd have happening over there. Aaron Cohen, thank you for your expertise. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it this morning. Good to see you, Aaron. All right, well, Thanks. this criminal justice professor teaching our kids tweeted this. It's a privilege to teach future dead cops. How does a guy like this even get hired? Unbelievable. And Hillary Clinton takes her blame game tour on the road, but is she hurting her own party and the country? We're going to debate that next. 24 minutes after the hour now, and some quick headlines and a tour around the Ivy League. You are no longer a freshman or upper class man at Yale University, now using gender neutral terms to provide, quote, gender inclusivity. A Yale College dean telling the school newspaper, quote, it's really for public formal correspondence and formal publications. We are not trying to be language police. Pete's looking at me and smiling. Uh, and Harvard is rescinding Chelsea Manning's visiting fellow designation, but she'll still speak to students at an upcoming forum. The school calling it, quote, a mistake after major backlash for hiring one of the biggest government leakers of all time. And for Peter, they did avoid UPenn, Princeton, and Dartmouth in this story, so I guess we're getting Getting off the hook for now. Abby? All right. Thank you, Todd. Well, this week, Hillary Clinton going on a blame game tour while promoting her new book. The unprecedented action of the FBI director, the interference by an adversary nation. Sexism and misogyny. I don't think the press did their job in this election. Russians pretending to be Americans who were online and in person uh, trying to foment negative stories about me. The more professionally successful a woman becomes, the less likable she becomes. Mm. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> and the, the election is over. Is it time for her to move on? Here to debate is former Hillary Clinton Director of Strategic Communications, Adrian Elrod, and GOP strategist Jennifer Kearns. Good morning, ladies. Thank Good you morning, for being here. Jennifer, what happened to out gracefully, having a bit of humility? Well, you know, it's been such by a few folks this week that Hillary Clinton is like the O.J. Simpson of politics. She's still out there a year later looking for the real killer of her campaign. Turns out it was her. Um, I tend to agree with that. Uh, I can tell you as a campaign press secretary for the last mm -hmm. 10 years, um, this is what happens. This is a 
textbook case of a candidate surrounding themselves with yes people. Um, they surround themselves with people who tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Um, I always had a policy. I told candidates, I will never lie for you. And I'll never lie to you. And that includes giving you the mm -hmm. hard advice. It's very clear this week uh, in this book tour um, that Hillary Clinton has still not had advisors close to her that have been willing to, to really tell her the hard truth, which is she bears the burden of the blame for her mm -hmm. failed campaign. You still don't hear that, though, Adrian. I know you have a, a different perspective on this. She has every right to write her book and to talk about Absolutely. the experience that pain trail. I think the, the problem that many people have with this is we are still hearing excuses as to why she lost versus her taking a look in the mirror saying you know what I lost this election right. maybe it was the messaging wasn't perfect maybe it was just you know the mood of the country at the time it just it was what it was look I mean and a lot of that is is getting a lot of the fact that she is talking about that in her book and she does take blame for many things uh, and, and is not is getting lost in the shuffle because she is out there talking about the other factors that came into play. The fact that Russia had, had a major influence in this election, the fact that we did deal with sexism, sexism and misogyny to a huge level. But again, she's not. She is taking plenty of blame in the book, and that is what maybe is not driving all the headlines. Look, I was on this campaign from the very beginning. Um, as somebody who lived and breathed every moment of this campaign, I want to understand what was going through her mind at some of these pivotal points. And so do the millions of Americans who are buying this book and reading it. Um, the 65 million people who voted for her want to understand what was going through her mind. So but she's more just, than earned her right. And that's fine, but why not just move on? I mean, we've heard, uh, even though she may talk about other factors in the election, I mean, she, she does blame a, a number of other things as to why she lost the Electoral College, James Comey, you name it. Um, you think back on other candidates that have lost races. I mean, mm -hmm. just most recently, Mitt Romney, you know, it goes back. You don't see them out on tour like this. And I've got to say, this past week, the optics looked a bit odd when you had this hurricane, the second one that has hit this country. You have the president on the ground there helping the people there. It just didn't sit right when you're, you have Hillary Clinton there talking about still why she lost the election. Well, and, and, and to her point, she, she may have explained it and taken some blame in the book, but she certainly did not on her media tour. I mean, let's not forget Hillary Clinton herself was out there on the trail this week doing these. A, a campaign spokesperson. This is straight from Hillary's mouth. And as you said, she blamed everyone from FBI Director James Comey to Bernie Sanders to Matt Lauer to, oh, Donald Trump stood too close to her at a debate. Yesterday, she said that it's women's fault because women's husbands and bosses must have told them not to vote for her. I mean, I think this is very instructive of the kind of president that Hillary Clinton would have been. Completely disagree. We saw this in Benghazi. Right, very, very quickly, the finger we've got about of, but herself. Very Unfortunately, we have to go. But okay. I know you have your perspective as well, and we appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Ladies, really good to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right, next, the Fox News alert. St. Louis turns into chaos last night. Police officers hurt dozens of arrests made. Kevin Jackson is live in St. Louis and is fired up about the case that surrounds the protest. He's up next. Also, President Trump making this 11-year-old boy's dream of mowing the White House lawn. Yeah. We are back with a Fox News alert. Chaos in St. Louis overnight. An American flag in flames and police under attack. And more protests expected today. A former officer's acquittal in the death of a black man now sparking that violence. Former cop Jason Stockley shot drug suspect Anthony Smith in a 2011 fatal shooting. People outraged over the judge's decision, forcing police in full gear, pepper spraying violent crowds as demonstrators throw bottles and bricks at them. 32 protesters are under arrest right now and 10 police officers injured, one possibly breaking his jaw. Police also recovering a handgun during the demonstrations. That was in the mayor's neighborhood. All right, right now we want to bring in Kevin's contributor live from St. Louis. And Kevin, before we get into the nitty gritty of this, let's talk about the city of St. Louis to begin with. How would you describe the safety of that city on a day in and day out basis without protests? <laughs> well, I believe it's the da most dangerous cities in the country. I believe that Forbes just recently rated it that. Uh, literally where I'm standing, where the mayor lives, if you go a couple of blocks north, 
you would be in one of the worst areas of St. Louis. You're, you're at, the probability of you getting killed would grow geometrically, if not exponentially. To our east is East St. Louis, which everybody kind of knows about, right across the river, another dangerous place. So look, we're, we're in a very dangerous environment where police are needed, and the last thing the city needs is for somebody denigrating cops yet again when we're talking about a heroin dealer who tried to run over police officers. And I think that that's where people are kind of missing the outrage. We keep talking about everything that the police did after the fact. The police did not seek out uh, Anthony Lamar Smith. They came up on a crime scene and he ran. And everything that has happened since then, are, it has nothing to do with the police outside of, and, and, and it should be investigated. And we understand the tragedy. But the real tragedy is that Anthony Lamar Smith was dealing heroin and we act as if he's Rosa Parks. This man should have surrendered in this conversation. Hey, Kevin, uh, as far as the police there, uh, it, it, their response, they're getting bottles and bricks thrown at them, yet some in the so-called mainstream media talk about their tactics back at these so-called protesters. Uh, you know, what more, if anything, can the police do in light of the misinformation campaign being waged against them? There's not much that they can do, and when they don't have the support of the mayor, who I'm standing in front of her home, then it, it, it makes a problem even worse. But look, guys, this is not a St. Louis problem. This is a problem that's all over the country. And po police are being vilified. And the, the job that they have to do is in the worst areas of these cities, in the neighborhood where, that I live over in South City, which isn't technically bad, but it's, not, it's certainly not safe. I want to see police presence. It's mm -hmm. funny that after the mayor's home gets attacked, uh, there are police officers <laughs> stationed all over this neighborhood to make sure that it doesn't happen again, but in neighborhoods where they need it, like in North City, where people are being killed every day with black on black crime, we don't have that police presence because they don't want to help. Yeah. So this is not a, limited to St. Louis. By the way, all these cities are dying. You, St. Louis has gone from, has gone from 850,000 people in 1950 to 318,000 wow. population. Go look at the statistics for Baltimore. Well over a million people, they're down to 600,000 plus. Detroit was 2.1 million, it's 600,000. These cities are in a death spiral mm -hmm. for, the, for the very reason that leftists want us to believe that the police are the bad guys. Look, folks, if, if people are taught the real lesson here, which is when police officers come to you and want to do something yeah. because they're doing their jobs, if we surrender and, or just say we're good, Everything goes. Almost everybody we've talked about in the past few years would be alive without that. No, and you talk about police officers. I mean, have they done that? Yeah, and how many incredible heroes there are out there protecting all of us every single day. There's one professor who tweeted out about teaching future dead cops. He's now been suspended. Uh, this is right. his tweet. He says, some of y'all might, might think it sucks. I fascist teaching a teacher at John Jay College, but I think it's a privilege to teach future dead cops. I mean, this is one professor as an example, but it just speaks to the rhetoric that's being used today and, and why the morale of police officers um, has suffered. Yeah, Abby, good point. You know, so we've got, you know, Hollywood people that want to cut off the head of the president or kill him. Uh, there's, there's hardly a day that goes by now that somebody yeah. doesn't threaten the president or in this particular case, threaten the police. And these are people, they're human beings. They have children. They, they have lives. They want to take vacations. They take off the uniform. What are they then? Are they not Americans? And, and we act as if they've been dropped here from another planet to play Gestapo in America. Yeah. Police officers, mm. if you give them a choice, they would rather be in a nice neighborhood than covering the neighborhoods where, where, the neighborhood where I live. They'd much rather cover a nicer area of St. Louis because they know what they're going to run into, but they come into harm. Yet we have a left, a, a group of leftists and a handful of people here in St. Louis over, the, over this particular incident that want to make these people out to be inhumane people that hunt mm. blacks. That is ridiculous. Yeah. And we wow. had um, a story about a police officer's wife recently, and she said the best feeling that a family has for a police this. officer is when you hear that Velcro coming off when they get home at the end of the day because you know that they're home safe. And this yeah. is what they they feel, you know, every day they kiss their loved ones goodbye in the morning and they don't know how the day's going to unfold. This is just the new reality that we're in. Kevin Jackson, Kevin, thank you so thank much. Thank you, sir. Wow, it's uh, it is amazing when you think about it, what uh, what they face and what they do every day yeah. for us. And, and you send your kids to college and maybe they're being taught by Antifa. That's wonderful too, mm. right? Think about
about that? This guy's sure. openly an anti-fascist Antifa teaching kids. Uh, that's uh, pretty standard, unfortunately, yeah. especially that, in New York City. Well, he that has language been suspended. is just unbelievable. All right, turning out to some other headlines we're following. The teenage girl in the Slender Man stabbing will avoid prison after being found mentally ill by a journey. A jury, rather, and Nisa Wire will be sent to a mental hospital now for at least three years. Wire admitted to stabbing a 12-year-old classmate back in 2014. She told investigators that she and co-defendant Morgan Geyser did it to please the fictional horror character Slender Man. Geyser pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease. Her trial starts in October. That is so disturbing. And not so fast, undocumented immigrants in Maryland will not be allowed to vote in local elections after all. The College Park City Council voting on favor of that measure. But it turns out it didn't actually pass because it did not have the city charter's required number number of votes to adopt the much debated measure. At least six other Maryland communities currently allow non-citizens to vote in their elections. And homecoming season is here and students at one school must now submit photos of their dress before they even buy a ticket. Students in Pewaukee High School in Wisconsin must submit a picture of themselves in their dress to a female counselor for approval. The school says it will help avoid situations where students might be sent home from the dance for an outfit that's too revealing. Parents are calling it sexist and micromanaging. Wow. I never had any of that back in the day. No, neither did he. And a kangaroo makes a